what is power? I'm Michelle. I completed my MA in social work from TIS Bombay and I've been uh, assigned to work in SM. Hello, sir. I'm Isra. I did my master's in women's studies from Sorry, Kat your? Uh, I, I, your name? Oh, Isra. I did my master's in women's studies from Tata Institute Bombay and uh, I'm currently, I mean, I'll be moving to Odisha next month. Uh, I've been placed in Balshankara block in uh, Sundargarh district. Sundargarh. Good morning, sir. My name is Korean George. Uh, I did my master's in rural management from Institute of Rural Management, Anand. And uh, which I, I, year was that? Uh, year before last. So I will be working as a thematic anchor for enterprises, and will be based out of the Trivandrum office. Trivandrum. Good morning, sir. I'm Rajpriya. I did my rural management from Science Ranchi, and uh, currently placed to Kutpani Block, Jharkhand. Um, Hello sir, uh, I'm Asta and I have done my uh, masters from Excelsis Strachi and uh, currently I have been placed in Bihar, uh, Gaya District. Yeah. I'm Jitika. I did my masters from Azim Tenji University and I am placed in Shahpur Block of Thani District. Of Thani. Hello sir, my name is Akshuti. I did my masters in social work from TIS Mumbai and I am placed in Rajasthan, Udapur District. Hello sir, I am Rishikesh, I am from Chhattisgarh. Uh, I did my Master's in <coughs> Development Studies from IIT Guwahati. I have been placed in, uh, in Rajasthan Kota District, Sangur Law. Hello sir, I am Anusha. I did my main social work from TISS Bombay and I will be working out of Toronto. Hello sir, my name is Kinti. I have completed my Master's in Development from Azim Peng University and placed in Ratnagiri District, Maharashtra. I personally prefer using the word deprivation to using the word poverty. There's a reason for that. Poverty, the way we have the word, the use of the word, not the actual meaning of it, but word, has become so contrived that you look at poverty as a kind of disease, you know, which no particular person is responsible for. Deprivation argues that somebody has been deprived. If somebody has been deprived, somebody is there who has done the depriving. It suggests that there is an agency of human agency at work in causing some. So I generally use the word deprivation, but it's not that I have a hardcore objection to the use of the word poverty. I don't. I use that also. But uh, so if this, I have something that I'd like to show you a little later on, but. I'm sure if you have things that you want to discuss or talk about on issues of poverty or <coughs> what's happening in the field and in the countryside now and stuff like that, you can you can just straight away go to you can do it as a discussion. On the field was the functioning of the panchayats in different states. So we got to see a stark contrast in that aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when looking at Kerala and then I had gone to Bihar right after Kerala. So from your experience, you know, like, uh, can you tell us a bit about, you know, how panchayat should be functioning and what you see as uh, causal factors in good functioning of panchayats in a state and in alleviating poverty? You are quite right that there would be very stark differences between the panchayats in different states. Not only that, even the Kudumbashree work that uh, you try replicating, will reflect those huge differences. Mm -hmm. It has to reflect what that state and that society is. Actually, Professor Kannan put it very well in his opening remarks that day. He said, Kerala was ready for Kudubashi. You know? The society was ready for Kudubashi. It had already gone through a vigorous phase of local body development, of local bodies and their expansion. In 10, 20 years, there was a big deepening of the understanding of what is a local body, what is local government. And as he said, one of the triumphs was, uh, both he and Vijayanand said, that one of the triumphs was working out the relationship between Kudumbashree and the local bodies and the panchayats. That you work with local government but not for local government. Uh, that's a level of maturity of 
the way these bodies work, that takes a long time, but more importantly, it can take a short time also, but it, it has to be, the political process has to be there. The problem with development studies, the problem with many of these courses, I mean, I teach some of those courses, the problem with them is approaching poverty or deprivation or backwardness or whatever we call it as a project to be resolved. It will never happen there. Okay? It's not like going and constructing a dam somewhere or putting up a bridge somewhere. As long as you're going to look at it in those ways that, you know, this is my assignment, go solve poverty, poverty in Latehar and Palamu in six months, you're not even going to get started. Poverty is not an event, it's a process. Second, the, there are, if, you know, the poor are poor for, for reasons. You know, the pastor Herrera once said, when I feed the hungry, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are hungry, they call me a communist. Father, Pastor Herrera said, when, they, when I feed the hungry, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are hungry, they call me a communist. Okay. I think that sort of catches that difference between, so you know, as long as you are going to be doing their tinkering, trying to uh, say, okay, this is the problem. We have to raise this income to this level. We have to see that this employment comes. Then you are always, you are not stepping out of the project framework. Yesterday you had an example, I missed most of that, but that is the only session in which I missed a lot. I don't know if I should be sorry, but uh, the, I heard Dr. Manoj making an argument, which was two arguments actually. One was a techno-fix argument, that you know, we can solve this with technology, and the other was the entrepreneurial argument. I made a business plan, you guys have failed to implement it. It's a, it's a very delusory, delusionary line of argument. The first part of it is that, you know, the techno fix. Poverty does not arise from a lack of or absence of technology. So it's not going to be solved by infusion of technology. You know, there is this romanticization that has been done around technology. Huh. that how the cell phone, this will liberate the poor. Are the rich without cell phones? The first guy in the village to get the cell phone is the, is the Sahukar, long before agricultural laborers get it. Hmm. So they will say, cell phone will allow the farmer to set the price in the next village. So I have seen this in Bolangir. Okay. Yeah, the farmer will find out that there is a better price in in that, in that, instead of, if he should go from Bangamunda to another block, there will be a better price there. Except that nobody will buy because all the merchants have formed a cartel. So he'll take his poor bullock cart and go there, you know, go 40 miles, 50 miles, 60 miles, and then he'll sit there with his produce rotting because the sahukar in his village has already formed the merchant in that village. They're all from the same caste. They're from one fraternity. They have set the price. So you take your bullock cart and go and I came across poor Ramdas Naik sitting with all his onions rotting. He went from village to village, village to village. But the merchants, they also have cell phones. So they, are bet they have more money to spend on use of the cell phone than you. I am not saying that the cell phone can't be useful to you. It can be extremely useful. Yeah. But it is not more useful to you than it is for the guy for whom it was designed in the first place. With, with those business, uh, ne your networks matter. It's, it's not just that. So I have a brand new satellite phone. Okay, who do I know who has one whom I can phone? The, the techno fix thing is a dead end. You can do things with technology. You can do terrible things with technology. You can do wonderful things with technology. You can stir a cup of tea with the barrel of a gun. 
but that's not what the gun was designed for. And ultimately, it will perform best the function it was designed for. Right? Use, don't, so the, any thinking of technology without thinking through its politics, its likely impact, because when you bring technology in, it can, it's going to be strengthen the already entrenched privilege. Unless you have a conscious political thought process on how to subvert that, which you can and must. I'm using a digital platform now, as I think, in a way of subverting mainstream media. Not very, it's not a very large subversion, but I will use that media, I will use that technology. Use technology, don't romanticize it. Don't think that it is liberating. Don't think so at all. That's nonsense. Don't romanticize that there are problem, highly complex human problems can be solved by technology. Okay, now look at say agriculture. All its problems were supposed to be solved by technology. You had a green revolution, you're having gene revolution. All these problems of agriculture were supposed to be solved by technology. What did you do? You have created the most, you created an incredibly complex uh, chain of inputs which get more expensive and more complicated with each passing year. If you started using certain kinds of inputs 10 years now, it is very likely that you are using double the amount of inputs. Five days ago I was in a Haryana village. Every one of them reported that their use of fertilizer, pesticide in five years had doubled. The more you use of that, the more you get into that. I'm not saying never use fertilizer, that's not my argument. I'm not saying never use pesticide. But keep finding ways in which you don't wean, I mean that, you know, that you are structured into increasing dependence on this. Because that will kill you. Okay, maybe I'll give it to you in an example. Suppose we take two identical twins. Okay? We take two identical twins. Two guys, let's say. Sashi A and Sashi B. They are identical age, weight, height, sex, everything. These are identical twins. They are both performing tasks in the village. I say that Sashi A, we decide societally, Sashi A will continue to perform his tasks on his normal life, his normal lifestyle, his normal diet. Sashi B will be given steroid supplements and both will continue sashi a and sashi b one on normal diet one on steroids will continue to apply themselves to the same tasks now who's going to perform out who is going to perform best huh short term. sorry short term. immediately who's going to perform best sashi b yeah so Sashi B is going to perform a lot better, right? So at the end, at the end of, so in every available indicator and measure, Sashi B will perform, outperform Sashi A. At the end of six to 10 years, Sashi B will be dead. And Sashi A will plod on through life the way he was going, okay? And from the fifth or sixth year, you will find that or even from the third year, Sashi B will require more and more steroids to be performing at that level. Look at athletes in the Olympics. Look at those, look at the Ben Johnsons and others. Few years after they've taken the steroids, they have serious, severe health complications. People die of it. Again, I'm not saying no technology. I'm asking you to understand it in a context. I am arguing, the point of that example, I am arguing that we are conducting agriculture on steroids. That's what we are doing. And therefore, you are demanding more and more and more steroids. So, 
we are hooked into particular kinds of chemical inputs. I am coming from the village of Iman in uh, Kurukshetra, where they said in five years, input of input of uh, pesticide, input of uh, fertilizer, seed, everything had doubled. They are pumping the soil with steroids. The second thing about where you're going and where you're looking at agriculture and poor people and the dependence on that sector, for instance, is, see, economists, especially mainstream economists, can never, ever, ever understand or explain agriculture. It's a mystery to them because they look at it in terms of input and output. Okay. You put, you, you make so much input, you get so much output. Why is that a fundamentally wrong idea? Why is that a fundamentally wrong idea? You put something into a factory, you invest in a factory, you expect this output. Okay, fine. Why is it a fundamentally wrong idea here? Depends on other aspects also. The land is limited, sir. Because yeah, for farmers, yeah. farming is more than just input and output for them. Yeah, yeah. but in what way? Factors that you're not accounting for, like positive, Be negative, externalities. Between input and output in agriculture is something called soil. Mm -hmm. It has a life, mm -hmm. it's accumulation of millions and billions of living organisms. Okay, so it's not that you put the thing into the machine and the machine puts out something. Soil is not an inanimate machine run on electricity. Okay, soil is a living creature. Every square inch of soil has more organisms, living organisms in it than you and I can count. What you are doing to that soil with your inputs becomes a key question. Hmm. The more chemicals you put into that soil, the more you might be killing. Maybe, I'm not saying you will always be doing that. But in the chemicals we use presently, absolutely. You are killing that soil. All over the world, we are getting huge reports in this country, very large, of what is called soil fertility loss. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, who is the found, one of the founders of the Green Revolution, is warning that soil fertility levels are approaching desperate levels in India. Okay. So, you, now what happens when you have soil fertility loss on that scale? Last year, you used one ton of uh, you used one ton of uh, fertilizer, this year you are going to use two tons of fertilizer. Then your crop, the, the, the pesticides you have increased have led to a huge degree of immunity developing in pests. Monsanto has admitted on record on its website that it withdrew Bolgard 1 because the pink bollworm which it targets had developed complete resistance and immunity to Bolgard 1. The second thing is the nature of pesticide is when you put it to kill insect A, it will also kill insect B, C, D, E, F and G. It's not going to stop with killing the insect that you want to kill. In agriculture, in in any many many cultures, there are also no things known as beneficial pests, friendly pests. Okay. Now what happens is that you go, you're you're wanting to kill the bollworm. You create a particular situation where the bollworm dies, and a number of other pests die. The other pests were beneficial pests which are keeping down the population of tens of other pests. Now when pest B to, B to G die, then pests H to Z emerge because you have removed their natural predator. 
if you remove if you remove the if there are no if there are no wild cats no no tigers no lions no uh, uh, wolves in the forest in the jungle there will become a pest by the way they will grow in millions because there's no natural predator to hold that population down likewise with pests nature has worked out a balance where these these creatures keep each other down now in vidarbha and elsewhere after they brought the anti bollworm gene it killed the bollworm initially it released hundreds of other pests especially one which is called uh, lashkarioli which means the military worm because it's got stripes on both ends of the body yeah it's called lashkarioli yeah. so uh, i had never seen one before i had never seen a lashkarioli before and you could put your hand on one bowl of cotton and pick up five i had never seen it i'd been familiar with that region for 10 years and i had never seen it. then in gujarat it killed the bollworm and released what is called a mealy bug go and look up all these stuff you'll find millions of so one year two years the crop was destroyed by mealy bug so you don't know the we don't know it's not predictable what the impact on the chain is bt corn in usa has killed the monarch butterfly which is a healthy pollinator of crop of flowers of fruit of corn of all sorts of things now that pollination process has become dependent on artificial pollination or creating or more creating crops that do not require it it's like the medicines we take we take one medicine a then we take another <coughs> medicine to deal with the side effects of a there's no end to it it's a it's a kind of system where the problem is so when you're getting to it's how you understand the what is poverty how you understand what is deprivation what are the key elements of that okay guys tell me something what is poverty <laughs> I think the term all of us came out with is multi-dimensional. Multi-dimensional. Yeah, multi-dimensional. Looking beyond economic terms and also looking at social deprivation and social inequalities that exist and the disparities that exist among populations. Okay, sir. <coughs> When I see the people in the village and live with them, so what I feel that. Uh, for me the poverty is injustice to marginalization deprivation and not only deprivation but they were deprived and further they were exploited like anything so for correct. me that is missing word exploitation <coughs> correct so another thing don't he is very right don't depoliticize poverty it didn't come out as a disease or a it came out because of what human beings do to other human beings exploitative relations that's where it comes from if you are looking at it as oh this person is poor let me help her or him achieve this level without looking at what are the factors holding down that person you may actually be causing damage also of course you do the things to help that person improve But if you do it without an understanding of what the background canvas is, it can hurt. It's like uh, people come to Vidarbha, to Marathwada, everywhere, and they make a big scene of going and giving some money to the farmer's widow. I'm not at all against this. I give, but it is a very, very, very wrong thing. to let that process in any way be seen by anybody because you go and leave one lakh at her house two seconds after you've left the village her husband's creditors will be there 
to bully her and take the money from her. So because you you felt like you felt good, I have gone and saved the masses. Okay. So you have actually done that woman damage. The very first farm suicide in Andhra Pradesh, I covered that one. I asked her, I asked uh, Nagalak, so what is the, what is ultimately your main problem? She said, you are. She said, the minute you leave, you come here in a pant and shirt and all that, and the minute you leave my house, the money lender will be here saying, oh, that fellow must look like a government man, no? How much did they give you? Hand it over. I'll show you photographs I've taken in the farm suicide houses where the money lender is standing right there in, in her house. And he's laying claim to his position there. He says, your husband owed me three lakhs. There's no way of proving it because all loans are there. These transactions are informal. Nobody takes out stuff on stamp paper or receipts and things. She will believe him. She will not question the fact that her husband never consulted her on any loan he took. He never told her how much. He never maintained her record. So all sorts of people will show up and say, your husband owes me this. She sees it as her moral duty to clear that burden. So her life is held from that minute. Not that it was heaven before, but most to another level. Yeah, so be conscious that poverty, deprivation come out of the exploitation of human beings from other human beings, by other human beings. And that there is such a thing as class, there is such a thing as caste, there is such a thing as gender, and these and many other factors go into that exploitative process. So if you're looking in a village to understand that, but you know, all those, you, see, you know, multi-dimensional factors are very important. But it's also to be able to establish in a given place which are those. See, poverty is then you can see it as the sum total of a number of, a multiplicity of factors. Um, you know, a lot of which are common in many, a lot of which may, see, the, it's a multiplicity of many factors, the weightage of which Weightage of which factors may vary from region to region, culture to culture, society to society, but a hard core of which factors is common. No? Whether it's hunger and malnourishment and nutrition, health, there is a certain number of factors that is hard core common. There are other things that are that have more cultural specificity, like the use of footwear. Chennai, even now, you can see your high court judge in his bathroom chapels in the morning going and picking up the newspaper from the corner stand. In Bihar, there is a totally different significance attached to footwear. Completely different significance. <coughs> so, uh, the weightage of certain kinds of factors varies. It becomes important in one area, that's important in another area. But that hard core the core group of factors, exploitation, hunger, the condition of the girl child, literacy, these are a core of factors which you can identify much good. But another good way of doing it, and that, that, that's why, because of that variance and the standard factors, a damn good way of knowing about poverty in the village you are looking at is to ask people in the village. That's how the best surveys are being done. I would suggest as individuals that you will talk to, you will talk to and ask the village, which means the establishment village, separately. You will ask women separately. You will ask the Dalit Adivasi groups separately. But also ask everybody at the same time, because 
that itself will be an education and hierarchy of who will speak and who will not speak. And as I said, a love for variance. I was once in Chhattisgarh in a village where the season, agricultural season was on and one TV crew drove in. Right into the center of the village, this crew came in, people jumped out, started shooting, filming, they needed the, uh, they needed the, what do you call it, the ethos and the milieu, ambience, ambience is the word they use, ambience shots of the village, so they shot out there. I think the whole, I don't think they were there for more than half an hour. So, intrepid young reporter jumped out, asked, you know, there were four or five guys immediately there and the reporter asked them, uh, so things are terrible with all this drought and delayed rainfall and everything else and and so these these guys were there in their, you know, dhotis and bare chested and all that. She addressed them. The reporter, had, anyway. So they they spoke. They said they they spoke very very clearly with great articulation. The crew jumped into its jeep and went off to tell you the story. See how many mistakes were committed in the space of the first minute. First, they drove into the center of the village. Why is that a problem? Upper caste somewhere. Bastion. The village geography is that the center of the village, the best part of the village, the little, the little island around which that universe revolves is the center of the village. What was that? Thakur Basti. So they were. Now, the poor reporter did not know. In innocence, complete innocence, she spoke to those, she listened to the four guys who spoke the most. In that block, in that area of Chhattisgarh, those are the four biggest landlords. She thought because they are not wearing shirts, they are poor people. It is agricultural season, you don't wear your Benetton in the field. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it was the damn agricultural season, so they were not wearing shirts. So they were wearing dhotis. And, and, uh, and if the reporters had been sensitive, had they noticed, they would have seen that only those four spoke. They were Malik Lok, Bade Lok, or Bhal Lok. Ballo, as they say in that corner closer to Odisha, Ballo, like Bale Lok. Local truncation is Ballo. So nobody else spoke when they spoke. That should have told you. Nobody else spoke when they spoke. Now that is also the respect of the village for the hierarchy. It's not for you to go and tinker with it there. But it, it will tell you that you need to speak to others. So I would, you know, I would do it by saying, you know, I want to know what the ladies of the village think. Sort of move it away from the four guys who are giving the answers to everything. The more politicalized person will start answering questions. Okay, then how you ask your question will actually determine the and who and where you are asking, what that question is. All these things will determine the kind of answer you get. In the 90s, the NSS conducted a bunch of completely moronic surveys. They were called thin sample surveys, which meant that they had only one question. Have you and your family had two square meals today? Tell me how many mistakes there are in that question. Asking that whether every one of your family members had meals. That's one. Today. Today. What is today, today. excellent? Yeah. Questions are always addressed to in India in head of household, who is assumed to be male. Who's the one guy 
in the household who has no idea of the consumption pattern so long as he is eating. And he is the first guy in the house to eat. Yeah. The woman of the house serves him, feeds the children, <coughs> aged parents, then she eats. She has a sense of who ate what, who ate how much, of what. She is the only person who can sensibly answer your questions. But she is not head of household. So you are addressing it to the guy. You are addressing it to the one guy who had two square meals. Second, you are doing this. NSS is a round the year operation. So you will get very different results where you are doing it during the harvest season where everyone is having three meals. Then there is the cultural specific. So you ask the wrong person the wrong question at the wrong time without defining what is a meal, without what is a square meal. And then there is the cultural specificity. East UP you go and ask, how are you, how are you doing? They will say, with your blessings and the grace of God, we are doing very well. You ask that question in a Kerala village, they say we are we are, we are doing horribly and we are going to bring this government down. <laughs> Do you know what that survey ended up showing? Do you know what that survey ended up showing? If you think that's funny, look at the result, it's funnier. It showed that more people were eating square meals in East UP than in Kerala. The cultural specificity of the reply one, you asked people for whom it was like a, a greeting. How are you doing? Ki hal hai? Or, aap kaise kar rahe huh. For another, it was a challenge. Right. So, the politicalized person brought out the grievance, put out his laundry list of angry, anger. The, 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 other person saw it in terms, thank you, saw it in terms of, you are inquiring after his family. And he answered you in that. In the survey in 94, this thin, it's called a thin sample survey, which means that they will just ask a few, a restricted number of households and only one question. Only one question. Have you and your family had two square meals? So you see, even the country's greatest data collection agency can really screw up big. When your question is stupid, when who you ask it is the wrong person, when the period in which you pose the question is the wrong period, when you don't factor in all that and the background and the canvas, then being too, thinking you are being radical can also cause giant damage. I just, you know, I was in Telangana in 98. There was a huge conflict going on in one part in Mahbub Nagar between landlords and uh, agricultural wage laborers who were asking for more. So I went to the village. What do you think? Who was the first person I would speak to? There are serious wage demands. There are serious um, issues of labor, who would be the first person to speak to? In a village? Yeah, I'm saying you're going there in the context of this huge, there's a context. There's this huge battle going on between laborers. It's already had small elements of violence, not much, but it's on a short fuse. It can blow up at any time. You need to understand the wage question. You need to understand what are correct wages, what are the workers looking for. You need to understand how inflation has affected the worker, how it's affected the farmer. You need to understand all these questions. You need to know whether this living is a living wage and can be what are the people you talk to first. <coughs> Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I won't comment until you tell me. Please, please. Leaders and women. The women of the wage earners. Please. Hmm. I would speak to the landlord first. Why? Tell me why. 
Is the one who knows the margin? He knows. Context, context. Poverty is not a project. You're talking about human beings. You're talking about human relations. You're working, walking into a village where there is an explosive situation of tension. Hmm. He is the landlord. You are the wage laborer. I come and talk to you. I have already created problems in the village by not respecting his suzerainty in the village. After I leave, he will take it out on you. Do you understand? I want to know that you've understood. Yes. Huh? He will take it out. He will ask, he will ask you, Kane bhai, you know, what connection do you have with him? I have, by going first to him, I have sorted out his ego problem. Yeah? He is, I am showing him the respect as the number one man in the village. He is the alpha male of the pack. Okay? I am acknowledging that he is alpha male. After that, he will not be so hostile to my speaking to him. But if I speak to him first, by that, the, immediately the news will be relayed to his haveli or his house. And he will already be hostile by the time I arrive. He will be very cagey. He will not speak openly. He will never speak fully openly, but he will speak far less openly than he would if I went to him first. Okay. Also, if I am going there, there is an agricultural labor group. I will have already made my connection with the agricultural laborers union. Hmm. So the agricultural laborers know that I am not hostile to them. They know I am not hostile to them. And they understand perfectly well why. They understand perfectly well because they understand caste. They live under it. They understand perfectly well and not just as political people but even as, as, as Dalits in the village, they understand that it is correct to show respect to the Malik first. Correct. So, my coming and talking to you first gets him very suspicious. But by talking to him first does not make you suspicious. You are very glad that I have also spoken to you. Right. The Dalit, the agricultural laborer is also, he is glad that this reporter has also spoken to me. He is mad if I speak to you first. So, you will polarize the situation in such a way that you have really screwed up. Am I connecting guys? Yes. yes. There are other reasons why you go to certain places first. So this is something which we face in the field also. Yeah. Because, uh, how to handle, how to talk to hierarchy. Exactly. You have to learn how to swim in that pond. Yeah. Hmm. Now, the story, by the way, the story I wrote said very clearly what I, what I found. But the landlord was happy that he was also quoted. His view was given there fairly. Now listen to what happened next. Those days there was no uh, NDTV yet. I mean, the, no, it was slightly before. Yeah, there was Star News for NDTV was a software company producing programming material for Star TV. It was called NDTV for Star. Anyway, some one of a local from Hyderabad or somewhere and one person from Delhi, it was not NDTV, but star, one of the star channel people, they came down to the same village because my story was carried on the front page of the Hindu Sunday magazine and became a very big deal. The agricultural laborers unions used the article in the assembly, etc. Immediately one crew went off to that village. They went straight this was a chance for them to do a radical story without any cost because A, the story had been done. B, there were no corporates or executives or anyone involved. Landlords you can condemn in the media. So, uh, yeah, there's no, come, there's no come back at you in advertising or anything. So they came and they, they went straight to the Dalit Basti and spoke to the agricultural laborers put them on camera, see, 98, 
satellite TV had dispersal was not as great as it is today. So now those guys had spoken to me in trust and confidence because I was there with their union organizer, who's a fellow who has been shot four times. So they trust him that he is a guy who's taken bullets for us. So however strange this outsider looks, he must be okay. Having come with our man. Now these guys just went to the Basti, spoke to those things, filmed them, and on night it was on what they fondly think is national TV. And so there, imagine that that Dalit laborer is criticizing the landlord on TV, on national TV. The only person in that village who has a TV and electricity is the landlord. Next day, six houses were burned in the Basti. How you, you are extremely responsible to those whose lives you are investigating. Next day, six houses were burned. Now, how does that guy know the impact of, you know, he is facing the camera, you have to be responsible for him. So he said in Telugu that, yeah, you know, they've done this, they've, they've not paid us even back wages, all this problem, you know, we are owed money, they, they, they're breaking the law on the minimum wage, you know, they've broken our agreement and this man is not budging. In those days, that guy had a 28-inch Sony screen at home. Okay. Because by the way, the landlord, including those four people, you know, in Chhattisgarh also, those four guys wearing no shirt, three of them were supporting their grandchildren's studies in the United States. Poor things, no shirts. They were bearing the cost of their grandchildren's exhibition, education in private universities in the United States, man. That guy has more money than I'll ever see in a lifetime. In one year he makes more. But that was the thing. How you enter everything that you do in the village, every inquiry you make, is also a negotiation of your space. It's also a negotiation of your rights, your position in the temporary position in the hierarchy. Everything is a negotiation. You're asking someone a question, five questions, you're negotiating with that person. Okay, so this is how you would go about in it. <coughs> Read everything you can on that district, block and village. Read everything you can before you go there let the data be challenged by the reality you meet, but read. <coughs> it's only when you've done that and the data conflicts with what you're seeing on the ground, it gives you a healthy, critical understanding of data also. What else? So, <coughs> at a lived experience of my childhood, uh, when I was uh, the, the child and my own family, extended family, community and entire village. Mm. Uh, <coughs> we <coughs> had five times me mm. and our need was uh, only kapra, salt and kerosene because that was not produced in on the land. And uh, <coughs> now most of the fam uh, families of my village, they depend on the PDS system. And uh, that is one thing. Another thing that <coughs> in the village, particularly where we are working, agriculture is a culture for them. It, still it is a culture, it is yeah. not an industrial sector, all these things. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, I talked to one Mukhya that uh, what is the situation of agriculture in your, your panchayat? Then he said that we are <coughs> selling the, uh, we are living by selling the soil and next generation will die without soil. That is because what all these things are going on. <coughs> and the situation is now in village, the needs, aspiration have changed and it is like the forest without tribes because any tribe t uh, get education, they don't go back to forest. So similarly the 
farmers' children were educated, they don't want to be in the field. So in the, it is a very serious issue how we deal the agriculture, who will work on the agriculture sector and how will, what will uh, take as a food. That is, I want to know who will work on the agriculture field and what will eat.